Um, oh, thank you, man. Okay, great. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for being here. I'm really excited today to host a conversation with two uh, organizers from the Debt Collective. Um, I'm Indiva Janalagada. I'm a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania and a graduate fellow at the Andrea Mitchell Center, which is uh, sponsoring this event. Um, so we have here today the uh, members of the Debt Collective, which is the nation's America's first debtors union. They organize debtors unions using an emancipatory activation of household debt under finance capitalism. Their motto is that alone our debts are a burden, but together they make us powerful. Household debt leveraged collectively in the threat of a debt strike creates the power to remake contemporary financial relationships. Um, the Debt Collective's first debtors union has won over $2 billion in debt abolition for people holding debt from for-profit colleges. They've published a book entitled Can't Pay, Won't Pay, The Case for Economic Disobedience and Debt Abolition, and I highly recommend it to everyone. Um, and the Debt Collective is organizing, uh, oh, sorry, that's that's already passed. Um, so let me, let me move on to the speakers for today. Firstly, we have... Hannah Apple, um, an economic anthropologist interested in transnational capitalism and finance. Um, she's associate professor at the University of California, Los, Los Angeles. Um, she is interested in finance, debt and debtors unions, the African continent's place in global capitalism, the economic imagination, anti-capitalist and abolitionist social movements. Her research and teaching interests are guided by the economic imagination. What does it mean to understand racial capitalism ethnographically and to work actively to undo it? Her first book, The Licit Life of Capitalism, is both an account of a specific capitalist project, US oil companies working off the shores of Equatorial Guinea, and a theorization of more general forms, of forms and processes that facilitate diverse capitalist projects around the world. She is also co-founder and organizer with the Debt Collective and co-author of Can't Pay, Won't Pay. We also have here Braxton Brewington, who is a communications professional and electoral organizer focused on racial, economic, and democratic justice. Braxton currently works with the Debt Collective, a uh, as I've introduced already. Uh, recently, Braxton worked as a communications lead for the Democratic parties of Georgia and North Carolina and served as a field organizer for U.S. Senator Cory Booker's presidential campaign. Braxton was a democracy fellow with Common Cause, where he worked to galvanize students to become civically engaged by registering them to vote on campus, organize marches to the polls, and lobbied Congress. Uh, Braxton was a state spokesperson in North Carolina for the Rufo case and cites his speech at the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court as the event that propelled him into fighting for a powerful multiracial democracy. Um, so we're very excited to have both Hannah and Braxton here. They have a lot to share. Um, actually, Hannah had mentioned to me that it's a debt collective tradition to mention um, one's uh, one's financial debt. So I, I'm just going to say that Hannah and her family have over $80,000 in debt and Braxton has about $45,000. And this is something just to keep in mind as we're, you know, thinking through today and, and the ways in which debt binds us, the ways in which debt um, suppresses us. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Hannah and Braxton. Wonderful, and Divar, thank you so much, and thanks so much to everybody for coming. I'm going to start us off, and then I will um, pass it on to Braxton. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to make sure I'm sharing computer sound, and then let's see, it's coming. How does that look? Can you see it? Is that working? Wonderful. Okay, so again, thank you so much to everybody for coming. Thank you to Divar and the Andrea Mitchell Center at University of Pennsylvania for hosting us. Our talk today was um, rightly publicized under the hashtag cancel student debt. And we will indeed be talking quite a bit about that. But in my introduction today, I'm gonna make a kind of, I'm gonna offer a broader frame that you see here in the subtitle from debtors prisons to debtors unions. But to cut to the punchline, the image that you're looking at is from a really wonderful action that we had in Washington DC just a couple weeks ago that Braxton will um, talk about a bit. So here we go. 
Again, we are mostly here to focus on student debt, but it's incredibly important to the work that we do at the Debt Collective. It's important to me as a scholar of debt and finance capitalism that we understand student debt as just one symptom of a much broader systemic problem. So that's why my introduction today is really gonna zoom out just a bit to talk about household debt and debtors unions. So what I'm gonna do at the beginning is just take us through a kind of whirlwind of statistics on household debt in the United States. I know we're in an academic setting. The point is not to take notes on these statistics. The point is just to kind of let them wash over you to get a sense of where we are right now. So about 73% of the people in the United States die in debt, owing an average of $62,000. 40% of people use credit cards to cover basic living costs, including rent, food, and utilities. And I should be very clear, until I specify otherwise, all of these statistics, for which I'm happy to give citations to folks who want them, are pre-COVID. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how COVID has affected household debt, these are pre-COVID statistics. So I am not telling you a story of pandemic disaster. I am telling you a pre-COVID story of racial capitalism. 62% of personal bankruptcies in the United States are linked to illness and healthcare costs. In the wake of the Great Recession of 2008, thanks in large part right to the rent relationship of the mortgage instrument, Black families lost an astounding 50% of collective wealth in the process of losing their homes en masse, and Latinx families lost 67% of collective wealth across the country, right? And we're about one decade out from that, but still very much seeing the effect of that intergenerational wealth theft. So as most folks here know, student debt today is at nearly $1.8 trillion. That's with a T, it is actually second only to mortgage debt in this country and of course rising every moment. About a third of delinquent debt, which is to say debts that folks haven't paid, is from unpaid bills, and one third of all households report debt in collections, which is to say they're being pursued by a debt collector for a variety of unpaid debts. Incarcerated people have an average of $13,607 in carceral debt alone, which is to say in debts they have been debts they have incurred just from their relationship with the criminal punishment system, fines, fees, restitution, bail. Sometimes you have to pay for your own room and board while incarcerated. So carceral debt, a significant part of this picture. And then if we wanna talk a little bit about the current moment, debt under COVID-19. Of course, we've seen what was kind of heretofore this unprecedented and somewhat radical idea that there can be moratoria on debt or that they can even be canceled altogether. So pandemic debt forbearance was really good for people, especially for poor people. That said, the average US household spent one entire stimulus check on debt repayment and households with uh, income below $40,000 spent nearly half of all their stimulus payments on debt repayment. The aggregate unpaid medical debt just for treatment of COVID to date amounts to between 60 and $125 billion. You saw an earlier statistic about medical debt long before the pandemic is the main driver of bankruptcy. Now we're looking at an extraordinary surge just in unpaid COVID medical debt alone. And of course, 6.4 million renters across the country, tenants, are behind on rent, right? Having not been able to pay while they lost their incomes during COVID. Oh, they together owe more than $20 billion, right? So we still face a rent-related eviction cliff across this country. Okay, so what's the point? <laughs> it's a lot of statistics and it's really depressing. The point, from education to incarceration, housing to medical care, payday loans to utility bills, Household debt is at an all time high. And again, we were already making a version of this presentation before COVID. COVID has only deepened it in certain ways and also made it more unstable in other ways, right? Which is wonderful for organizing. So we can see from these statistics that household debt is a systemic condition. It is not the individual failure of those who make poor choices in a fair system, right? This is not like, oh, 45 million people made an irresponsible decision to go to college or graduate school, and therefore they all need financial literacy about student debt, right? No, we are not talking about individual failures. 
We are not even talking about financial literacy. We are talking about household debt as a systemic condition. But when we name that household debt as a systemic condition, it's very important to hold intention. What does it mean for something to be systemic, but also radically unequal at the same time, which is to say unequally shared. So I just wanna kind of float these concepts that probably many of you are familiar with, predatory inclusion and racial capitalism. So household debt is systemic, but it is not evenly distributed. Mass indebtedness has profoundly deepened pre-existing racial and gendered inequalities in the United States and far beyond. I'm a scholar of transnational capitalism. I'm happy to talk transnationally in the Q&A. For right now, in part because I'm, we're talking about the organizing terrain of the moment, I'm talking about the United States. And of course, we're not just talking about race and gendered, but we're talking about the intersection of race and gender. So disproportionately across all of those categories of household debt that I mentioned earlier, Black women are in almost every case disproportionately burdened by household debt. So for example, we know that we disproportionately incarcerate Black men in this country, right? It is the women in their families who are trying to find the money to scrape together fines and fees, who are trying to find the money to scrape together restitution, right? So trying to think about household debt, how it affects entire families, how it affects intergenerational families, how it affects communities unevenly and unequally. So one of the terms that we like to use and from our comrade Kianga Yamada-Taylor, who is a professor relatively near you and lots of folks have, have used this phrase, right? Is predatory inclusion. Many of the fights, for instance, of the civil rights movement were for inclusion into credit markets, which is to say inclusion of black communities into the mortgage market, inclusion of black communities, immigrant communities into public schools, right? That organizing was extraordinarily productive and fruitful and powerful and did indeed lead to forms of inclusion but the form of inclusion is predatory, right? You, Black family, want a, a mortgage? Here's a subprime loan. You, Latinx or immigrant student, now want access to what used to be tuition-free schools, right? The University of California system, we refer to it as public because it used to be tuition-free, then you will start to pay. Once it is no longer a historically white institution, right? Once we see the 60s and 70s with folks mobilizing on college campuses across the country, demanding in, demanding that their, um, the curriculum that you might see that teaches their histories, right? Demanding an end to the Vietnam War, demanding teaching about imperialism at these colleges. Ronald Reagan, then the governor of California says, okay, you want in? then you're gonna to have to pay, quite literally, there's a quote. And then of course he becomes president, right? This is predatory inclusion. You want in, you're gonna to have to go into debt for it, but because of the way racial capitalism works in this country, you don't have access to that family wealth, right? So you're gonna go into more intergenerational debt. So racial capitalism is a systemic condition, right? Household debt is a systemic condition. Racial capitalism is a systemic condition. And what do we know? Systemic conditions require collective responses. It doesn't require all of these hundreds of millions of people getting financial literacy. Financial literacy is not our problem. Debt financed access to basic goods and services in a racial capitalist economy is our problem, right? So systemic conditions require collective responses, but what kind of response is possible, right? What does counterpower look like under finance capitalism? the debt collective, what we say is it looks like a debtor's union, right? And so what I'm going to do in my remaining minutes is just talk us through the provocation of a debtor's union, which Indivar really well um, kind of introduced at the beginning, but I'll talk us through it a little bit again. And I'll talk us through some of our victories leading up to the present when I will hand it over to Braxton, who is extraordinary and will tell you extraordinary things that he and many others have been doing. Okay. So as you heard, right, this is the kind of catchphrase that we often use at the Debt Collective to describe what a debtor's union is and how it builds power. Alone, our debts are a burden. They're a source of shame. They're a source of isolation. They're a source of marginalization. They're often a source of fear. I don't want to pick up that phone call. I know it's a debt collector. Ah, I'm not going to open that piece of mail. I think it's a bill and I know that I can't pay it, right? Alone, our debts are a burden, but together, they make us powerful. 
And this is actually a financial argument that I'm going to describe to you in a moment, but let's just look at this kind of class. This is a classic illustration used in collective organizing all around the world, right? But so for debt organizing, picture the top big fish, that's a debt collector, right? The debt, collective is, the debt collector is swimming after all of us and we're, we're swimming apart, we're scared, we're afraid, we don't wanna answer the phone or open the mail. If all of us turn around, we are in formation, organized, we are bigger than the debt collector, right? That's what that um, illustration is trying to show. So when I say this is a financial argument, what do I mean? We at the Debt Collective often invoke the very famous 20th century industrialist, John Paul Getty, right? So if you don't wanna kind of believe it from an activist, why don't you believe it from a capitalist who very famously said, if you owe the bank $100, that's your problem, which is to say, you have to pay that back. But if you owe the bank $100 million, that's the bank's problem, which is to say you have leverage over the bank on the terms of your repayment, right? Corporations know this. Bank bailouts know this. Very wealthy people, right? Donald Trump is the king of bankruptcy. They understand that huge amounts of debt are a form of power. They're a form of leverage. They enable you to negotiate with the creditor. It is just household debtors alone who, especially because we are alone and isolated, haven't been able to wield this power. But at $1.8 trillion for student debt alone, we own the bank, right? Think of all of that medical debt. Think of all of that carceral debt. Organized together in the shape, in the formation of a union, it offers us a form of power. So just to give you kind of like a really quick genealogy of where this started, this is 2011, so now a little bit more than a decade ago, we celebrated, we celebrated, we came out in the streets on one T day. Student debt hit $1 trillion in 2011 during the Occupy Wall Street movement. So this is us out on the streets in New York, playing on you are not alone to say you are not alone, right? When we came out in 2011, because so much media attention was on Occupy at the time, media came out, they covered this event, and they were derisive. You know what they said to us? You know how they covered us in the media? They said, oh, these people want their student debts canceled. And if the government would be so generous, they also want free public college, right? They derided us. And today, as you'll find out more from Braxton, we are literally on the verge of student debt cancellation in this country. And there is federal law proposed to make public college free again. Of course, public college was free in the past, right? But it's just to say how far we've come in a decade. So in 2014, we started to organize that first debtors union that Indivar mentioned with folks who held debts from for-profit colleges. What we were using, so here you see the original Corinthian 15 declaring the nation's first student debt strike. They say to the Department of Education, to the loan servicers, to the Genesis Lending Company, to Corinthian and ECMC, we have one thing to say, we owe you nothing. And I'm happy to talk about this more in the Q&A. This is a question that we often get. Debt strikes are risky. And they're like any other strike, right? A strike is kind of the last choice of a union, right? You build for years. So I'd be very happy to talk about how we built to this debt strike. But one of the things that I wanna say is all 15 of these people were already not paying and they were suffering the consequences alone. They were suffering garnished wages. They were suffering a trashed credit score. They were suffering inability to access an apartment, right? Alone. So it's politicizing can't pay into the collective won't pay, right? So the Corinthian 15, we also put up an online piece of legal mutual aid called Defense to Repayment. About 80,000 people used it, according to the Department of Education's own record. And this got our union invited pretty quickly to Washington, D.C. in 2017 for a negotiated rulemaking process with the Department of Education. And now, of course, Defense to Repayment is the law of the land. In 2019, the Debt Collective was invited to introduce the legislation drafted by Ilhan Omar and Pramila Jayapal, who you see there with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the back, to introduce their legislation initially called College for All that would cancel all student debt and make public college, trade schools, community, um, community colleges, HBCUs and tribal colleges free, again, on the back end. And here, I'm not gonna play it, but if you look to the Debt Collective's YouTube, YouTube channel, there is Pam Hunt, one of our member leaders, giving a fiery speech on Capitol Hill, of course, with Bernie Sanders behind her. So that legislation was introduced in 2019 and very much to their credit, Ilhan representatives um, Omar and Jayapal said, 
these have been the debt collective, de debt collective demands for years and inviting us to, to make the demands on Capitol Hill. So 2019, we start to see some debt cancellation, right? Some debt abolition. So here's one of our members from Facebook, not only having the debts that they owed in the future canceled, but also getting money back from the federal government for what they had already paid. Again, these are folks who hold debts from for-profit colleges. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. That started at the end of the Obama administration. It continued, and this is a very important lesson on what collective power can do, no matter who is in office, right? It continued under the Trump administration. So here is Betsy DeVos, Trump's Secretary of Education, signing a debt discharge notice with extreme displeasure, which of course gave us extreme pleasure. That's like maybe the highlight of my life to this point that we got Betsy DeVos to sign that. So we've actually just through defense to repayment alone, and we can talk about that legal mechanism if folks are interested. We've generated about $4 billion in debt discharge for debt cancellation for folks who hold debts from for-profit colleges. But we have never been about the bad apple, right? This isn't about, oh, for-profit colleges are bad and going into debt for the University of Pennsylvania or the University of California system is good, right? That has been a struggle. How do you get the public past this kind of like bad apples, bad actors, um, and into the idea that all of higher education financing is broken in the United States and it is student debtors who have the collective power to make new demands. So with that transition, to talk about how we've tried to do that, I will turn it over to the one, the only Braxton Broomkin. Thank you for that, Hannah. Um, okay, so I wanna um, sort of take it back from this point of 2019 and get to where we are today. A lot of what I'm presenting on shows how the debt collective and debtors more broadly have really successfully shifted the political landscape of student debt cancellation and college for all. So I can sit here all day and say, talk about the economic benefits of canceling student debt, which would boost the economy by $108 billion per year for the next 10 years. It would create millions of jobs. Um, I could talk about the racial aspect of student debt cancellation, which would narrow the racial wealth gap by 40, per, 40 points. I could talk about the morality of student debt. I could talk about the pedagogy of teaching. There's so many, you know, there's just so much, so many aspects to student debt cancellation, but um, not to mention the, you know, the legal argument is a huge part of uh, the opposition of folks with student debt who like to claim that student debt cancellation is on some sort of faulty legal ground. We have rebutted um, and continue to rebut all of those things and make the case for student debt cancellation. However, I just think it's important to, to you know, from our perspective at the Debt Collective, even if everyone was convinced of these economic, racial, strong legal arguments, there's still a, there still has to be a political mandate. And so I think what's really important is that we are able to shift the political landscape of what's happening with student debt cancellation by sort of really shifting the morality of student debt, really asking these questions of who owes what to whom. And so I think that's what sort of my portion is gonna really get at it, how we have really shifted the narrative. I was just looking at some videos of from 2019, 2017, very, very recently, of very mainstream economists from that are now in the Biden administration, that were in the Obama administration, that used language that if they were to use today, I think the majority of people would find a bit alarming, right? The way that they talked about taxpayers and the way that they talking talked about student loan debtors and sort of this avocado toast framework. So a lot has really shifted in just the last several months and really just the past few years. And I just want to take a moment to chat about that. So in um, day one of the Biden administration, January um, of 2020, we launched the Biden Jubilee 100. So this was, this is sort of symbolic, but it is still a debt strike, right? So payments, Donald Trump, you know, put payment, federal student debt payments and interest on pause in March of 2020. He extended that again, uh, twice again, and then the Biden administration came in and immediately extended that pause longer. So anyone who has federal student debt payments or interest is, those payments are paused, but still we launched the Biden Jubilee 100. So these are 100 individuals. If you go to biden100.debtcollective.org, you can find all of these strikers across the United States, some outside of the United States, 
who have remarkable stories about how, how student debt has impacted their financial and mental well being. And so this was a call for President Biden to cancel all student debt in his first 100 days. We are obviously since past that. And so we're still moving forward. So these are some of the strikers. Next slide, please. So now we went on to sort of politicize. So I think that strike was successful in you know, really starting this conversation of, wow, here are these folks that are refusing to pay, right? Not just these for-profit colleges of 15 people who are using um, an obscure law that already exists, but people who are saying, despite the consequences, and because you know I can't pay, I won't pay, we now have 100 people in this Biden Jubilee 100 strike, hundreds of more people joined since then. So we then went on to politicize the legality, right? So canceling student debt, we like to say you can cancel student debt with the flick of a pen, with the stroke of a pen. We now, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer tweets it almost every single day. Biden can cancel student debt with the flick of a pen, right? That's how mainstream this issue has now become. And so if you go to debtcollective.org slash flick of a pen, there's a couple dashes in there, you can actually see the executive order that the debt collective wrote last year that the president could sign today to cancel all federal student debt. It's literally at this website. This is not written by some uh, me or other, you know, janky folks that maybe didn't go to law school. Actually, the same exact people who, who uh, discovered borrower defense to repayment and politicized that, right? The Department of Education had never used borrower defense to repayment to eliminate debt on any type of scale. The same lawyers who discovered this authority said, wait a minute, the Higher Education Act of 1965 says that the president and thereby their secretary has the authority to modify a loan, right? So you can, you can alter a loan, you can lessen it, you can actually lessen it all the way to zero. That authority is called compromise and settlement. And so what we did was, you know, again, if you go to this website, you can actually read the entire ex executive order that we wrote in collaboration with the lawyers who discovered this a borrower defense to repayment authority to say this is actually the executive order that president could sign to eliminate student loans with the flick of a pen. So obviously there's still this conversation of, you know, the debt collective says president can cancel student debt, but you know, who are they? Well, you know, we really need to see if the Biden administration says that they can cancel student debt. And before I get to what this image is, I should actually reference that when the, when the Trump administration, when Betsy DeVos put student loans on hold in the wake of the pandemic, reporters asked the Trump administration, what gives you the authority to put federal student debts on pause, right? No one was mad at the Trump administration for pausing student debt, right? COVID had just started, that was, no one was worried about that. There were no lawyers who were testing it, but someone said, what gives you the authority to do that? Betsy DeVos actually said, compromise and settlement is what gives us the authority to pause student loan payments. They then actually retracted that because I think they saw folks like the debt collective sort of celebrate and say, oh, they've admitted it. <laughs> they admit it that you can cancel student debt, you can pause student loans, you can pause interest, you can modify a loan. There's no rule, right? The rule is up to the Department of Education. You can use compromise and settlement authority. They actually retracted and said, actually, it wasn't that authority. We used HERO's authority, which is this authority that you know we can use in the wake of a crisis like COVID, right? Either way, we can cancel student debt through HERO's authority, but we're pushing this through compromise and settlement authority for a specific reason. So we said, well, let's try to figure out what is the current White House, the Biden administration using to think about student debt cancellation. So on April, I should actually back up in February of 2021, um, Jen Psaki, the White House um, press secretary, said that uh, the White House, the Biden administration, is reviewing our authority to cancel student debt by executive order, not through Congress, through executive order. Several months goes by, April 1st comes, and Ron Klain, the White House chief of staff, says the president has asked the Department of Education for um, a memo detailing his authority to cancel student debt through executive order, and we expect that in a few weeks. That was April 1st of 2021. We have since never seen that memo. So the debt collectors got a bit curious. Where is this memo? It's been several months now. Now it's been a year. Where is this memo? 
So we filed a, used with Freedom of Information Act, we filed a request to get any documents relating to this memo, thinking maybe we'll get something, maybe we don't. Sure enough, this past fall, we were able to obtain a slew of emails and a bunch of documents relating to this memo, which is titled the Secretary's Legal Authority for Broad-Based Debt Cancellation. The memo was largely redacted, right? This hot pink is not something that we created. This is whoever did the redactions put this hot pink color up there. I like to think that they were making a political statement by that. But what we know is that on April 8th, 2021, there was, there was a couple drafts before this, but this was when there was a final draft. On April 8th, 2021, we know that the General Counsel at the Department of Education sent a memo to the White House, which we know the White House received based off of these documents, understanding getting this document titled the Secretary's Legal Authority for Broad-Based Debt Cancellation. It's largely redacted. There are a couple of lines that maybe on accident or maybe on purpose are not redacted and they recite some level of um, authority about student debt cancellation that does give us reason to believe that other than this pretty clear title that the Department of Education did tell the White House that there is authority to cancel student debt. We also know through Washington Post reporting that a DOJ mem a, D a memo from the Department of Justice also exists to the White House about the same authority. We just haven't seen that memo. So we sort of exposed this, you know, legal faultiness. And I think largely folks will say, you know, not only does this memo exist, but also currently the Biden administration is canceling student debt, though grossly inadequate, though this sort of piecemeal approach of 40,000 borrowers here, 17,000 borrowers there. There is this, it would be sort of illegal gymnastics to sort of say, you know, that the Biden administration can't unilaterally cancel student debt when they have the authority to pause, they have authority to pause interest, and they're actually canceling student debt. We know that the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and the Biden administration has used compromise and settlement or some other combination of authority to modify or alter a student loan. So, just more, I just wanted to name some of the ways that I think we've started to sort of shift the political landscape. Um, this first inside, business insider article was sort of mobilizing faculty and uh, higher education instructors, right? Nearly 1,500, that number has since grown, but nearly 1,500 professors signed on a letter urging Biden to cancel all student debt, not $10,000, not $50,000, but all of student debt. This next article shows is actually an interview with uh, the Chicago Teachers Union, who has been very vocal about canceling student debt, the Los Angeles Teachers Union has as well, um, as well as a, a portion of the New York Teachers Unions and other faculty resolutions uh, at different universities have, have done the same. This is really important because these are obviously um, a constituency that Biden and, and perhaps Dr. Jill Biden would pay quite a, enough attention to. This is just some polling from Data for Progress, which is actually really crucial making the political argument. They've had several polls that show that the majority of Americans support student debt cancellation, at least in some part, maybe not full, but at least in some part, the majority of Americans do. A majority of Republicans, uh, Democrats and independents, but a majority of Republicans support extending the pause throughout the pandemic, right? So they say, as long as there's a pandemic, a pandemic as long as COVID exists, majority of Republicans in the United States support extending a pause on student debt. We also know in key swing states like Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, North Carolina, Florida, that a majority of young voters uh, say they're more likely to vote in 2022, this November, if student loan cancellation takes place. There's another poll that I should cite that says, 40% of Black voters say they would consider sitting out the next federal election if there is no action on student loan debt. And so the young, the polling with young voters is, is really important because that um, their disapproval of President Biden has significantly grown or their approval has significantly declined uh, in the past couple of years. It's now down like minus 30 points and it dips even further when you start talking about young Black and young, young Brown people. So we were really gearing up for this payment pause, um, which was set to expire May 1st. Um, 
just to be really clear, the payment pause is now set to expire on August 31st. I have not gotten an email from the Department of Education, but it is true. <laughs> it is set to expire August 31st. So on um, April 4th, right, a couple of weeks before the payment pause was set to expire, we went to Washington DC and had a direct action. And so this is just some of the signage that we used. The next slide will just, so I'm just gonna start showing some examples of what this action actually looks like. We had hundreds of people, nearly a thousand people show up to Washington DC. We had over, you know, dozens and dozens of co-sponsors, everyone from June Defenders to Harriet's Wildest Dreams, Move On, Sunrise Movement, Working Families Party, Justice Democrats, small unions, teachers and nurses unions up and down the East Coast and around the country. We had dozens of organizations come together and um, bring folks out to turn up to this action. So we had a giant puppet of <laughs> Joe Biden and we had a giant pen. Um, and if you look really closely, I think it's actually in another photo, you'll be able to see uh, a giant executive order, which is at debtcollective.org slash the pen that I just referenced. The next photo um, is specifically um, of a wonderful person who runs our TikTok. Her name is Maddie doing a debt burn. So this is something that we, um, it, was, it was incredibly intimate. That's actually me holding a vuvuzela. We had vuvuzelas, we had lots of horns. You know, the, the Hebrew reference of Jubilee is actually yobel or trumpet. And so, you know, in this sort of wake of student debt cancellation, we're calling for full student debt cancellation, calling for a Jubilee. It was really important for us to have brass bands and have horns there to, to actually mimic a jubilee and what it would be like when we win. Um, but Maddie, what she's doing right here was, this was a really intimate moment outside of the Department of Education where we had a debt burn. So this was a really um, uh, intimate moment for people to share their personal debtor stories, to talk about how much debt that they're told that they owe or how much we owe to the 1%. And then to burn it, right? So we have this flash paper or magician's paper. It's incredibly safe. It's, it's not, it's actually not really flammable. And so before they, they tell their story and then they burn this debt to symbolize a couple different things, depending on what it means to the person. Some people I like to reference, this is how quickly this debt can, can disappear, right? It happens in an instant. If you blink, you could miss the burn. But also to a lot of people, it just symbolizes their ability to like what Hannah referenced saying can't pay, won't pay, right? The burning of this debt shows I won't be paying back this debt and I'm burning this debt in solidarity with the people around me. So this was just a part of that action. I think the next photo is actually um, Amy holding our uh, blown up uh, executive order, which um, right under the line says XOXO from the Debt Collective, um, which is a great part about this executive order. And so a lot of people sign that um, actually on another page behind it to show that, you know, this is how easy the signature could happen. So the next clip I think is of Dr. Shamel Bell, who um, is our visionary escalator at the Debt Collective. This is while we're marching. So I hope folks listen to what she says, but also can sort of take note of the people around her and sort of the jubilant energy that was there literally as we marched around the Department of Education. So that was, <laughs> that was an amazing action. Uh, but I should say, just to give a little bit of reference, we marched around the Department of Education, sort of like in this biblical style of uh, marching around the walls of Jericho until the walls fell. And so we were actually very uh, intently checking to see if the seventh time when we walked around, if they would have extended the pause on student debt didn't quite come around that exact moment, but it did come the next day. As you can see right here's Team Vogue reporting on the Debt Collective's day of action. This is April 4th. 
The next day, we see Biden to delay student loan repayment, right? This US Today article, USA Today article, which references us. But this actually other, this um, third uh, screenshot is actually what I want to reference, which is something that I think is really significant is um, this is, mind you, the department, the White House has just extended the pause on student debt through August, through August 1st. Just a few days later, um, you know, the chief of staff, the White House press secretary actually confirmed that said the White House will either extend the pause again through August 31st, or they will finalize their plans on canceling student debt. Right, so does that mean they're gonna cancel 10K or cancel all of it? Who knows, that is part of our job to make sure that it's as close as possible to all of it. Um, but what we know is like the political pressure is building so fast that they are saying that they will either cancel student debt or extend the pause before we even get close, right? We're not even at May 1st yet, right? Student debt payments where we really did this back and forth of, you know, 20 days, 30 days before the pause, they would sort of say, we're still making a decision, but now they're getting so ahead of it. And it's it, precisely because this is now just clearly a, an overt political decision, right? The, this is not a question about of, of legality. There's not a question about the macroeconomics, which are which are clearly on our side. I think the racial components have been made quite clear by really strong organizations like NAACP and others who have said, you are going to lose young people, older voters, you're gonna lose black voters, you're gonna lose a large women, you're gonna lose a large chunk of this party, the Democratic Party of your base if you actually don't take action on this issue. So I'll leave it there. The next slide I think is just like social media of the Debt Collective if folks wanna find us on Twitter, on Instagram, we're also on Facebook and YouTube and other places, but we're specifically quite active on these two platforms. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Hannah and Braxton, for sharing all those insights. And um, there's so much to discuss. I invite all the audience members to post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll turn to them in a moment. I'm going to just get the conversation going with uh, with two opening questions. Um, and I'm gonna address it to what each of you presented. So Hannah, I, I really appreciate you beginning with debt broadly and not just student debt and how all of these struggles are interconnected. Um, and you know, I wanted to um, touch on this, uh, what you said about what does counter power look like? You know, since this is an academic space and some of our audience might be academics, uh, I'm sure we all relate to being in a seminar about neoliberalism, just wondering what do we do about this? Uh, and this is such an important and interesting model that is being put forward. So could you say a little bit about this idea of economic disobedience that is in that is uh, described in Kant, we won't pay the book. Um, I just love to hear a little bit about that. And then Braxton, um, you know, it's, it, you, your story is so inspiring because we go from a couple of years ago being dismissed uh, as a naive political struggle to becoming a force, you know, uh, becoming um, a force of change and pressure on the government. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about what that organizing looks like and how people are brought on board and how you work with different communities. Um, just, you know, just, um, broad details about that I would I would love to hear and and then we can turn to audience Q&A which are uh, queuing up so add your questions as well. Wonderful thanks so much for that question so I'll go quickly on this question of um, economic disobedience and debt broadly and again in an academic setting that feeling that we're all so familiar with when we're sitting around in a seminar and maybe we're discussing Marx or maybe we're discussing neoliberalism and it feels at once empowering and enraging and like somehow the discussion itself is a radical political act. And yet when we step back, it isn't necessary. That's, I mean, I'm a teacher, right? I value that space. This is not to kind of um, short change that space, but it is to ask, well, I'll put it this way. So much academic analysis about neoliberalism, so much academic analysis about financialization is about disempowerment, right? Is about de-democratization. But the provocation that comes out of intellectual, scholarly, political analysis 
of neoliberalism itself. And the much more we are reluctant to date this from neoliberalism in the 1980s when you look at racial capitalism and intergenerational wealth theft that long predates that for certain people more than others. But I will say, if one of the widely acknowledged shifts under neoliberalism is that even for the white middle class, right, basic needs are no longer financed by wages or salaries, but basic needs are financed by debt, right? Which is to say your higher education, your medical care, right? So as debt comes to replace wages as a form of social provision, right? That's kind of a, a good definition of financialization of the household. Rather than simply stopping it, oh, that's fucked up. And oh, I have a good analysis of this. The debt collective is saying that contains the seeds of its own overthrow. It is directly analogous and in conversation with Marx's argument about the power of the worker organized under industrial capitalism, right? The power of workers organized under industrial capitalism is that alone their job is scary and induces vulnerability, but together they can make demands, right? So too with the debtor under finance capitalism. It contains the seeds of its own overthrow. So that's what we mean, you know, economic disobedience like the strike, right? And I said this briefly earlier, a labor strike, a debt strike, for a union formation, this takes years to build up to. This is not something you, you don't go from you know point A to point B economic disobedience, especially because of how deeply the claws of the financial system are in us. The repercussions are grave and they are unequally distributed along predictable race, class, gender lines, right? So economic disobedience, it's like the, the credible threat of a debt strike, the organizing of all of those fish to do all kinds of things. Braxton just took us through an extraordinary narrative of legal pressure, of direct action, of media work, of branches all over the country. And maybe that's useful then to pass to Braxton on what that organizing actually looks like. But it's just to say that economic disobedience is one part of that and it's a meaningful threat, but it's not the whole thing. Yeah, we, I think one way that the Debt Collective has been really successful in just the past couple of years of really shifting the political landscape and making this an issue that people are hearing from all different corners of your life, rather than just sort of one, um, what I think is tip a typical, you know, grassroots up campaign. And so, for example, we have had dozens of cities and municipalities across the country pass these resolutions. So rather than thinking of student debt as a as an issue that is important for people who have student loans, we make it as um, we'll make this important for people for municipalities, right? So DC, Washington DC, Milwaukee, Boston, um, Cambridge, other very major cities across the United States have passed these resolutions saying we as a city, our city council, our town council, want President Biden to cancel student debt because it's going to boost the economy for our municipality, right? It will create small businesses. People, rather than giving $700 a month to the Department of Education, will be actually able to go down the street and buy some food and pay for their rent. This will boost our local economy. How do we use these already existing institutions like teachers unions, Chicago teachers unions, LA teachers unions, New York teachers unions, who have actually a major say in not just like our K through 12 education, but like national political policy. How do we mobilize them in a way, not that they need mobilizing, but right, how do we, how are we in relationship with those institutions already so that the Chicago teachers union can say, yes, we think that canceling student debt is a great issue, but the majority of our teachers who are most disproportionately women, black and brown women in particular, are student debtors. And so this would be a great way to give our members a raise in their wage. Um, for example, racial organizations that are organiz organizing around racial justice, right? For people who can say, you know, we are really trying to, you know, keep democracy from turning over to a complete fascist state after 2020, what is gonna bring folks to the polls in November? What is going to increase turnout and expand the electorate and make um, democracy more accessible to people? Well, you, what's a great way to bring um, a variety of people, you know, how do you expand the electorate, right? We know that 
Um, one in five Republicans say that we will consider voting for a Democrat if student debt were canceled. We know that uh, there's a good chunk of people who are actually not in the democratic process, non-voters, right, which is the majority of people, non-voters, who say that they would become, they would bring themselves into the democratic process if they were to see something like the largest economic, you know, bottom-up economic sti stimulus in recent American history, um, if that were to affect them in their personal lives, right, perhaps that would bring them into the um, democratic, democratic fold. So engaging with organizations, you know, who are sort of taking that angle. So I think one thing that the Debt Collective has done is not make student debt a higher education issue, but make it so that this is a labor issue and that this is a racial issue and that this is a this, that, and a third issue. And how do we bring people who are already prominent in those spaces just to just to adjust their framing to talk about this issue rather than like the debt collective and like two or three other organizations that are really really in the weeds on student debt to try to make this a national issue right I, that's just maybe that's i would argue not sustainable and so that's why i think we've been able to have such a large shift in a decade or even just the past couple of years because i think we're hitting this issue from from all angles and not making it just about student debt but making it about higher education and actually funding public goods you really are able to bring like a bunch of more organizations and people into the fold thank you so much um so with that i'm going to turn to audience q a so I want to note that in the audience Q&A, we have a couple of anonymous posts about, um, you know, people's own concerns. And I think these are really important and I will flag them because uh, I'm sure our speakers have advice and advocacy and strategy for you. Uh, but I'm going to start with some of the other questions so that we can have a little more discussion before we get to that. So the first one is um, from Mary Ebeling. This is for Braxton and Hannah. I'm gonna flag it so the audience can see it too. I'm an educator working at a private university for 15 years and have noticed over the years how student debt has had a direct impact on my teaching. It's hard to stand up in front of the classroom as an indebted subject myself and know that my students' futures have been leveraged by my university's real estate development efforts, literally. My students' approach to education as indebted subject seems to be to go through the motions to get the degree, to get the underpaid job, to pay off the ed debt. It is soul crushing for both educators and students. Can you talk more about how student debt affects pedagogy? Soul crushing indeed. Thank you for that question. Um, there are so many things I wanna say. One of the things that I wanna say is directly related to the spirit from which your question comes, many of us at the Debt Collective are educators. <laughs> Um, so part of it is like, write that question, how do we stop crushing our souls? We build power to fucking change it. Excuse my language, but we build power to change it. And we recognize that where we teach our daily life, right? Like you, I am both indebted and I'm indebting my students every day when I ask them to show up in my class, that the university is a terrain of struggle. This is not an ivory tower. This is not, this is everyday life. This is racial capitalism. This is the financialization of the household. And together with our students, right, in different ways are appropriate in the classroom and outside of the classroom, this can become part of our curriculum. There's some really spectacular pedagogical material out there now on student debt. So there's our book, Can't Pay, Won't Pay. Another debt collective co-founder who's a professor at NYU, Andrew Ross, wrote an excellent book called Creditocracy and the Case for Debt Refusal. Total, both of those are very good for undergraduate audiences. I would say even an advanced high school audience. There's the debt syllabus, the international debt syllabi that have come up. There's like the Caribbean debt project, right? There's a kind of larger structural adjustment. So it can be part of a broader curriculum around the question of debt and indebtedness and power. So I guess I'm saying, I think there are ways to teach about it in the classroom. We at the Debt Collective do guest lectures very frequently. We're always happy to come to your classroom. Um, but then there's also the kind of lived experience of our students who, are panicked about not being able to get a highly paid job after school. Some of them know about their student debt, others of them it's just kind of like an abstract thing sitting out in the future. But I think certainly from 2008 and after and undoubtedly long before that too, but that was when I was really aware of it. Um, the kind of instrumentalization of education is a profound 
problem. And I really think that building power to change the way that higher education is financed is the only way to do it. What good is a debt jubilee if formerly public colleges like the University of California system, University of Michigan, University of New Mexico, right? All, CUNY system, SUNY system, all across. The, what good is a debt jubilee if those aren't public again? but this time not just for white men, right? They were public, that is why we call them public school. I know what it means, I send my fourth grader to public school across the street, it means I don't pay tuition, right? Why at, at the college level do we have this historical amnesia that that's impossible? It's not impossible, we can do it. The Debt Collective is doing it, join us, join your teacher's union, join, right? I, I, I really think that organizing is the way to uncrush our souls. I was I was going to add a, a quick like personal personal note because um, I've never been an educator but I was recently a student I graduated in 2018 it wasn't too long ago and I mean I uh, for a while after graduating um, when people asked and throughout college when people asked how I was enjoying college or how I liked college I used to always say how terrible it was. And it took me a while to realize I was not um, separating my academic experience, which was, I think, a little more limited because most of my college experience, when I think about college, I think about Applebee's, I think about Bravo Casina Italiana, I think about Lowe's Foods grocery stores, I think about the fellowships that I worked because when I think about college, I think about working. <laughs> I think about working four jobs at the same time so that I could pay off as much of the loan that I could you know, at the beginning of the semester, I have forty some thousand dollars right now. I probably paid off twenty some throughout college, you know, because of working, and that really actually made it difficult for me to associate, you know, that experience with getting a college education, with actually being in the classroom and learning. And then it took me a minute to realize, wait, I loved my professors. Wait, I loved being in the classroom. I just was sleepy <laughs> at the time. I just like was thinking about if I was gonna make it to work soon. And I you know, had this conversation with some other friends and a lot of people say, if college is free, what they literally ask, what will be the purpose of college? Because people are actually committed to that ideology. They're committed to go in the classroom, I get my grades so I can get my diploma, so I can get a job and be more full, bring myself more fully into the economy. And a lot of people say, you know, well, then what would be the purpose of education? And I almost think, like, in a way, we're fighting to kind of return to that, where, like, yes, like, it is to learn and to go to school. And then if you realize that maybe it's not something that you want to do, then that's not something that you have to in order to be able to pay a, you know, a fair wage in the workplace, which even with a college degree, you are not for various reasons. So, you know, I just wanted to add on to the, the way that the that affects the pedagogy of like being a student, having recently remembered that. And I think fighting for student debt cancellation almost makes real some of that promise. Fighting for higher education almost makes free higher education almost makes real some of that promise. So that's my little plug to like students and former students right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so with that, I, I wanted to ask if you could follow up a little bit more on this idea of free higher education um, and, you know, what, what are the prospects for something like that in the U.S. and, um, you know, how, how this sort of broad-based um, you know, Braxton, I think you said, like, we need a political mandate and a shifting in morality. Um, you know, where do you see us in relation to this future of free higher education? Yeah, I, I think, Hannah, you, I would love to hear you talk about what, what, whatever you were thinking of just talking about, but, you know, specifically tuition and, and uh, maybe like the, you know, the junctification of higher ed and all of those things. But you know, I wanted to start by saying there's a lot of, um, you know, Astra Taylor, which is a co-founder of the Debt Collective, has a film called, called You Are Not Alone. It's produced with The Intercept. And um, there's this portion of the film where someone, I can't remember her name, maybe you remember Anna, what, who I'm talking about, where she talks about how we should fight to make college free and freeing. And I think that is also that freeing part is something that we've begin to think a lot more intentionally at the debt collective about how to make 
higher education as an institution frame, right? It's not just about tuition not existing or, you know, making sure professors are paid, you know, what they're worth, but also how do we um, get cops off campus, right? How do we end uh, violent campus rape culture that persists on universities? How do we make sure that the university as an institution is not um, um, contributing to climate change and exporting fossil fuels? How do we make sure that um, this is something that gives back to the community and doesn't take or extract housing from a community? So I think, you know, I just wanted to add all of those things on top of our conversation. I think when people typically think about making higher education free, right? If I, in a lot of ways, is it free to pay zero dollars to go to school if you're being harassed by police? Right? Is it is it free if all of these other things are if it's contributing to the burning of our planet? Is that really free? Is that something? Is that an institution that we should be fighting for? But you know, Hannah, I'm sure you have a lot to add. I'm so glad, glad Braxton framed it like that because I don't know if folks saw, but in the news recently, I want to say it was in Oklahoma, but I might be wrong. It was like this big announcement, like University of Arizona. Gosh, I'm so sad that I don't have it at the tip of my tongue. University of Oklahoma says it's going to be tuition free again. How did they fund it? Natural gas and oil extraction on indigenous land, right? They said, we are gonna use, and it was land that was not previously being drilled. It was not, it was land that was not previously being extracted. From. So I think there's a real danger, exactly as Braxton is articulating in a kind of narrow, like make college free again, without a broader understanding of the political economy of financialization and generally higher ed, how the federal government works, how the, fe the federal government's budget works versus how state governments work, right? Oklahoma has a constrained budget, right? They have to find money from somewhere to pay for something. The federal government does not have a constrained budget. Anytime the Pentagon is like, we want $79 billion this year, the federal government is like, here's 85. There's no, controversy, we are not told, oh, your taxes will have to go up. But here we are saying, hey, fund public higher education again from the federal level. And they say, oh, taxes will have to go up to do that, right? So to me, the question of free public higher education and freeing public education, right? It's about this kind of political ad that we're doing amongst ourselves, all of us right now, but it's also about the question of political will. Ditch the historical amnesia that neoliberalism has been forever, Remember that it was Ronald Reagan in response to protesters on college campuses across California, right? The rise of the Black Panther movement in Barrett colleges, right? In the community colleges. Reagan was like, oh, no, 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 no. If you want into these institutions of higher education, which were historically white institutions, then you're going to have to pay. And of course, because of how racial capitalism works, it's the very people who don't have the intergenerational wealth to be able to pay, which is intentional. And then the man becomes president, and then all of the public schools across the country start charging tuition. When we remember that history, we know that other worlds are possible. And Devar talked about going to college in India, paying way less. There is free public college all across this planet. And there used to be free public college here. We can do it again, but this time, not just for white dudes. Thank you. I love the idea of, of freeing higher education. And thank you for sharing that. Um, so uh, I just want to flag again uh, the comments and the Q&A. Um, you know, so Scott shared that the original principal of my student loan was 26K, but with accruing interest, it's now 60. Uh, and I'm on what's called an income-based repayment plan and the lender has deemed that I do not have enough of an income to pay anything. So my monthly payment is zero, but the interest still accrues. How is this fair? And there's no negotiation of my loan. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Uh, how, like, why is it, seen as fair? And then secondly, is it true that there's no negotiation? Want to talk about IDR and compounding interest, Braxton, or you want me to do it? I can, I can take a stab. Awesome. Might... Yes, everybody look at the bit.ly that Braxton just posted. That's super important. All of you who are on here, like, what the fuck my student loans? Go ahead, Braxton. I know, I just literally was like, I didn't put the student debt strike in this <laughs> presentation. Um, I'm getting to this question, but I should preface with the Debt Collective has launched a student debt strike. You can find it at bit.ly slash student debt strike. Basically what this means is, well, let me start with what it's not. It's not encouraging folks to intentionally default on your loans. We know that 
having payments been an interest being paused over the past two years, right? The Department of Education doesn't need this money to function. Our, us paying our student debt is not keeping the lights on at the Department of Education. And so this is what we're not encouraging default, but there are a lot of ways in which you can sort of safely pay $0 a month, whether it is, you know, using the waiver with public service loan forgiveness. Some people go re-enroll in college so that their loans can be deferred so that they can pay $0 a month. And what this person is referring to income-based repayment plan or an income-driven repayment plan. Oftentimes, depending on your income, you can pay um, a monthly payment as low as $0 a month. And so the first thing what we're doing is saying, rather than suffer alone, right, these sort of fish swimming about to sort of that, you know, together our debts are a burden, we're saying to politicize that inability and refusal to pay. And so paying zero dollars a month is this definition of what it means to be a, as a striker, that definition brought to us by the Corinthian 15. So we encourage folks who are, you know, enrolled in income driven repayment plans or trying to get to zero dollars a month. There's several ways to do that if you go to bit.ly bit slash student debt strike. Um, we know that income driven re repayment and other student loan, you know, repayment programs don't work in terms of administratively and uh, ideologically, <laughs> they do not work. One way to think of an income driven repayment plan which I should know is just a, a plan where you pay a certain percent of your of your income that uh, a lot of people will tell you that that income that percentage is a low percentage. I disagree with that, but you know, we shouldn't be paying any of our income for college, but they'll say that that's a low percentage and that you can pay those per month. Over 20 or 25 years and once that timeline is done, that the rest of your student debt will be canceled or, or will, will be abolished, right? So we have a bevy of forgiveness programs that already exist. We actually incentivize non-paying. The Department of Education, because the loans, because there is no return on investment, right? Because there, because this isn't actually super uh, profitable in the way that you would, that one would think it is in terms of other debt types. We incentive, and because of some morality of making higher education free or accessible, we actually incentivize people to not pay on their student loans. And so some of those programs exist today, but they simply don't work. There was a, just a, a GAO report came out just the other day that showed that the amount of people who have gotten their debt canceled through income-driven repayment is 157. Not 157,000, 157 people have had their debt canceled through this program. So we know that you know, millions of people should have had their debt canceled through this program, but it doesn't work because the Department of Education, the federal government, you know, they don't keep track of certain payments. They, the student loan servicers, which are these contracted private companies, don't really have any incentive to help you know, Scott or these other folks who are in this precarious situation, they don't have any incentive to say, hey, you should actually pay $0 a month. They steer people into forbearance where their um, interest rises and, and then capitalizes. And so we know these programs don't work. 98% of people have had, who have applied for public service loan forgiveness, that uh, application has been rejected. And so that's why we are, you know, that's part of the reason why we're pushing for full cancellation because these programs are actually a more regressive version of full cancellation is, a, is really a way to think about it, right? These are sort of these neoliberal people who are pushing for, um, you know, people to pay back their student loans over the course of a couple of decades just for the sake of paying it back, but who didn't want to follow up with canceling it at the end, right? Those are people, if you support these policies, you should be for cancellation. You just like want to stick it to people so that they can sort of pay a little bit for a couple of decades just to sort of put their skin in the game, right? And so we're saying we should have a cancellation program where we cancel it immediately, right? <laughs> Your program should be you pay $0 a month forever because all of the debt is canceled. And so these programs don't work. And you know, maybe Hannah, you can speak to sort of the like, really nitty gritty of the financialization of how interest capitalization works in all of these percentages. Yeah, that's a, that was a, such a good answer. And Braxton knows way more about all of the acronym programs than I do. And the other issue that Scott brings up in their comment that's so important is this question of what Braxton just referred to, interest capitalization, right? And it's like, 
for most of us, what is interest capitalization? So just to go back to Scott's comment, his original balance, which in a loan is called a principal, right? Their original balance was $26,000. But now, even though Scott is on income-driven repayment, the balance stands at over $60,000. In other words, the balance has gone up and up and up and up and up, even though the government is saying to him, given how low your income is, you are eligible for $0 a month, right? The same thing has happened in my family, though we're not on IDR. Our original balance was 65. We have paid $500 a month for years and years and years before the, the pandemic pause ever started. We now owe 80,000. We pay $500 a month and we owe 20,000 more than we owed at the beginning. So this is the miracle of what is called compound interest, right? So what does compound interest mean? In a loan, you have a principal amount. It is the initial amount that you owe. And then you have the interest rate. And the interest rates on student loans are excruciatingly high. They hover around 7%. For any interest rate nerds around there, there were times in the pandemic where the federal government, where the interest rate was below zero, right? The interest rates have hovered now around like the gen, the, fed, the federal funds rate has been like around 2.0 or something, right? 2.3, 2.1. Interest rates have been historically low. So obviously that's changing a little bit. Does that matter for student debt? No, student debt has stayed at 7%, right? So Scott's principal is $26,000. On top of that, 7% of that principal amount is also factored into whatever the monthly payments are. If Scott can't make that full monthly payment, if for example, Scott, and sorry, Scott, you volunteered yourself in the chat, but any of us, right? If we can't make our, our monthly payments, Whatever we weren't able to pay adds to the original principal. And then the 7% is calculated on this rising cost. We have members of the debt collective. Somebody came to our new member call a couple of weeks ago. She introduced herself as 81 years old, as having been paid on her, paying on her student debts for 20 years. And her student debt started somewhere around $55,000. She's been paying as much as she can. She's been paying what the government tells her to pay. And they're like $140,000 now, right? She's just gonna die with all of that debt and get the death benefit. So death benefit. Um, so the, the problem of compound interest is real and is part of the sort of rapaciousness um, of this particular kind of debt. Thank you. There, there seems to be a follow-up question um, in the chat from an anonymous uh, audience member. Did you want to take that? Okay, I think I, I think I get this. So, not quite. Um, there are there's several reasons of why there, this number is 157 and there's several reasons why uh 98 percent of people with, who apply for public service loan forgiveness have not had it canceled right because that's a that's a 10-year program that started close to 2007 right so millions of people should have had their should be getting their debt canceled every year after uh 2017 which is five years ago it doesn't work for anybody the reason is for a host of reasons. So I should note, the Department of Education doesn't collect on student debt. They pay a company to collect on it for them. The serp that's called a servicer. The servicer and the Department of Education don't quite talk as much as you would think they should. Um, the, the dynamic is, is quite odd. The Department of Education has to pay the servicer they have to pay for certain inquiries when they want to know certain information the servicers these are folks who I'm not trying to sympathize with the servicer which should be abolished which shouldn't exist right but there are people who are answering these phone calls who are disproportionately black and brown women in the u.s south who make like ten dollars an hour who only have so much information presented to them don't have any incentive to actually help these borrowers these debtors some of them debtors themselves there's just, it's just ripe with misinformation. And so people are, um, you know, what happens is a lot of time in people in income-driven repayment programs, 
you have to recert you have to recertify your income ever so often right so sometimes people forget they didn't know that they had to the department of education isn't literally literally is not keeping up with certain information and so what happens is you know as thomas Goki says that the Department of Education is sort of like trying to retrofit a Rube Goldberg machine, right? Every time the, there's a problem, they try to fix something on one end and they think that that will solve the problem of this program, IDR or PSLF, then that doesn't work. And so they need a waiver. And so now we're at a point where the waivers, waivers need waivers. And so it's really proving that this whole system is broken. Um, and I think that if you look at this GAO report, that it'll really start to show that there are just fundamental flaws, like the Department of Education is not literally not tracking certain information. And so what is happening is the Department of Ed is sort of streamlining certain processes to try to accelerate cancellation, right? To sort of get people to where they should, but even those things have flaws and, and it doesn't happen immediately, right? The Biden administration just announced we're canceling 40,000, we're canceling debt for 40,000 people. In their own press release, they say they should get notified this at the earliest quarter four of this year, right? So November at the earliest, maybe some people in this 40,000 amount of borrowers, which is about 0.1% of federal student debtors, that they should get their loans uh, canceled. But we know that follow through doesn't even always happen. There are people who have had their loans canceled, six notified of their debt being canceled six years ago, a year ago, who are still waiting on uh, their rightfully owed cancellation. And so, you know, we could go down a list of the administrative problems with this and, and precisely because of the administrative problems is why we're saying, you know, we should just cancel all of this debt. There's no reason why the education department can't just say, you know, if you've been paying any debt for 20 years, we're just gonna erase it. Um, but what that would do, I think, is sort of open up a political conversation um, similar to what we're talking about of broadly canceling student debt, because people are just going to say, wait a minute, the, the government can just cancel a certain type of debt, you know, and we hear this from the right, I'm almost done, we hear this from the right all the time, because people say, if you can cancel student debt, then what about my mortgage? What about medical debt? What about my auto loans? What about, what about, what about? And so our response is like, exactly, <laughs> exactly. What about those? And so you should join the debt collective. But sort of, to sort of get to that, I think that GAO report actually answers a lot of those questions as to it's the system is not designed to work. It is literally not designed, um, no, no, no matter how much, you know, communications that the Department of Education will spin it. There have been failures under the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and the Biden administration. So the problem is, 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 is to a degree, obviously political, right? Donald Trump, Betsy DeVos's administration was horrible, but to some extent that she had to um, follow, Betsy DeVos had to follow some things that were court order, right? And so really the problem is this sort of monstrous, catastrophic system of, of a, you know, rather than a grant, finance system where we've moved to a debt finance system of higher education and that's the problem. Um, thank you so much. So I, I'm mindful of the time and I, I want to raise a couple of uh, final questions to get your thoughts on. So, you know, firstly, uh, Braxton, you mentioned a couple of times that there's a, that the political landscape is shifting. And in recent years, whenever we hear that phrase, it's often not favorable or, you know, something we're excited about. But clearly there's a lot of, um, you know, a hope here. And I, I wanna touch upon that before we close about the shifting political landscape and what kind of future um, we're looking at. And uh, actually, and um, if I can add a sub question, or um, how much has the pandemic contributed to some of this shifting landscape? Uh, you know, as organizers and thinkers on the ground, like what did you see in terms of people's? So you, you noted how Betsy DeVos is, um, you know, signing off on the on the student loan pause was momentous and you know revealed something. But uh, that's at such a high level in in a, people's everyday lives. What has that pause meant? Uh, pause, not just in terms of the student loan pause, but the general pandemic pause. Um, sorry, two sort of big questions, but I'd love to end on that. Sure, I, that's a great question. I really think a lot has to do with COVID 
And um, I'm not going to call it a silver lining, but there is a sort of political shift that happens when people are not expected to make payments on the second highest household debt type in the United States for now over two years. People have gotten financial, almost financially and psychologically used to not having to check their account and make payments. And so people are literally, there. Are, there's, we're, we're getting, we're starting to form a generation of people that have actually not made student debt payments. I, my payments were paused, I deferred, um, and basically I'm at a point where I haven't had to make student debt payments since um, I've graduated, right? And so that's sort of my norm, right? Is not Hannah's norm. <laughs> my norm is not paying student debt payments. It's definitely worrying about the balance and worrying about my financial future, um, you know, but in terms of the cost, right? There's, but that money isn't coming out of my checking account. And so people really get used to saying, if the Department of Education doesn't need this money, it seems like they never needed this money. And it seems like they'll never need, it, never need this money. And I wanna like also use, maybe has Hannah, Hannah has thoughts, but I think Hannah's, Hannah invoking John Paul Getty, a capitalist to, to make a point. I kind of wanna do the same and invoke like the Wall Street Journal and these other sort of right-leaning or right-wing um, um, media outlets who have been talking quite explicitly about student debt. There was an opinion piece with the Wall Street Journal the other day that said, you know, it was sort of fear mongering and saying, oh no, student debt cancellation is about to happen. Has anybody thought about this unintended consequence that if there are a bunch of people who are indebted for higher education, there is no longer an incentive for people to join the United States military. They're right, they're being quite explicit <laughs> about um, what's happening here. There are, um, you know, we now have a generation of people who have had their social security checks garnished because they haven't had to pay student loans, right? Now that's happened. Now that loans are paused. So there's there's all of these um, adverse effects, right? So we haven't canceled student debt, but by nature of it being paused and people not being, you know, having that sort of level of economic security, I really think a pause for over two, two years, which the Biden administration, administration says they're going to extend it through August 31st, after August 31st anyways, right, getting close to March again. We're now coming up on three years of people not having to make payments. And so there's just going to, you know, the New York Times framed this the other day. They said it's going to be a real challenge. You know, this was, this was sort of like a frustration with the New York Times. There's going to be a real challenge to get people to resume making student payments. The debt collector says, there's gonna be a real challenge to making people resume student debt payments. And I think that pause is, is really key in, in aiding the politicization because so many people going back to the student debt strike, if your payments have been paused, right? If you haven't been making payments, you are a student debt striker, you're on strike. You just have to politicize it, right? Like you are not making, you're making zero dollar a month payments. And so I think now it's way more common to see people, you know, sort of jokingly say, you know, that debt isn't real, you know, God has canceled these loans. That's that's between Jesus, whoever I worship, and that's between Joe Biden, you know, and I think that really actually gets at the level of, you know, what has shifted of payments being paused. But Hannah, maybe you have something to add. I just wanted I completely agree with everything you said. I dropped the Wall Street Journal thing in the chat because it's so extraordinary. And in fact, the military has come out and said this quite um, openly. Vice Media has reported on it several times that the military uses the fact that if you serve in the military, they'll pay for you to go to college, right? As their one recruiting tactic. So literally it's like, let's conscript poor people into the radical imperial violence of this country just so they can get a college education on the other side and not go into the military. And there's the Wall Street Journal. I mean, it's it's so blatant as to be kind of extraordinary. Um, but I guess the broader thing that I wanted to say, and Devar to your question, and just to expand a little bit on what Braxton said, back out to this bigger household debt frame and what has shifted under COVID. You know, thinking about debt and finance as a social scientist, as an economic anthropologist, right? Many of us probably come from different disciplines in this spaces, this space. We are trained to question the veracity of money, right? Money is a social relationship, et cetera, right? And there are all of these kind of um, theoretically voluntarist ideas about actually how plastic and social 
our financial economic lives are. And therefore they have a tremendous amount of give and flex to them. And that's kind of like sexy to say in a book or something. And you might say, you know, you might read kind of feminist approaches to capitalism that I'm very much, my writing is very much a part of that will say things like that, right? Again, you kind of say it in a, in a somewhat idle way in a seminar or in the paper that we write or whatever. And then COVID-19 happens and there's a mortgage payment moratorium. There's a rent payment moratorium. There's a utility payment moratorium. There's a student debt moratorium. Suddenly there are basic income checks being delivered to people's homes. I mean, like the plasticity fungi just like dumps itself out for all to see. And so I think stepping into that moment and naming that moment and seeing that flexibility, not romanticizing it, understand like this is a political terrain. Debt is a political terrain. So what do we need to do in order to bend it to our will, right? It's not just like, oh, it's flexible. No, it's a, it's a terrain of contestation that wealthy people, that corporations, right? Look who got, you know, some of us got, um, you know, small basic income payments. A lot of big corporations got their PPP loans completely canceled. And they're like, oh, Braxton had this great segment where you went Fox or CNN and the host is like, what about the morality of canceling debt? Like don't debtors have to pay back? And Braxton was like, tell that to the 1%, tell that to the corporations who got their PPP loans forgiven, right? We are the only ones who are told and it's because we don't have power but we can have power, right? That is the provocation of a debtor's union. We can have, we can be too big to fail, right? But we have to organize. We don't have the bank balance that, you know, Bank of America has or whatever. So I guess it's like, I want to acknowledge the plasticity of the moment, but then not just romanticize that for what it is. And so what that means is we have to step in and build power to demand what we want of this moment, which is, for example, student debt payments will not turn back on. They will not turn back on. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, uh, we have come to the end of our time. There's a final question in the Q&A which says, how do we continue to build momentum now and what steps do you suggest as individuals? And I think everything Hannah just said really encapsulates that. Um, there's several links in the chat for you all to check out. Please do look at them. Um, and thank you for coming to this event. This, uh, I, I want to thank the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy, uh, especially Jeff Green and Matthew Roth for making this possible. Uh, I'm posting the link to the AMC website. We have other uh, events coming up and uh, we do every year, both academic and public events. Um, and again, a big thank you to our speakers, Hannah and Braxton. Thank you so much for joining us, for sharing uh, your insights and for you know um, answering all of these questions. Um, and just, I think also pointing us to hope, but also the upcoming sort of contestations and the political terrain we're on. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so, so much for everyone who's here. Thanks. Thanks for moderating this. Yeah, of course, it was my privilege. Have a great day, everyone.